Welcome on behalf of the Center for Public Leadership. My name is Donna Calico, and I'm the Executive Director of the Center for Public Leadership. Our mission is to advance the frontiers of knowledge about leadership and to deepen the pool of men and women who will lead for the common good. Today's leadership session will meet both of those goals for all of us. Before I introduce our special guest, Jim Quigley, CEO of Deloitte Touche Tomatsu Limited and Murdar Bagai, Managing Director of Alchemy Growth Partners, I wanted to share my own personal and professional connection with Deloitte. I'm a Deloitte alumni, served, and I served in the former office of Haskins and Zells from 1973 to 1977 in Boston. I was the first woman to be promoted to senior accountant, and I'm a CPA. It was the best training ground I could have ever had. When I worked there, you were evalu evaluated not only on your professional competence, but also on how well you trained your people. I believe those values have shaped the foundation and principles Deloitte is known for today, promoting leadership, encouraging women to lean in, and embracing cultural diversity. But I don't want you to think that a public accounting firm was all work and no play. I met my husband, Marty Calico, at Haskins and Sells. <laughs> he worked in the tax department, and I worked in the audit department. And I'm proud to say that we will be celebrating our 34th anniversary this week on May 6th. <laughs> so even love can flourish there. <laughs> As one individual action collective power. One of the most formidable challenges of business leaders and all leaders today is getting large groups of people to work productively towards a common purpose. For the past two years, Deloitte Touche Tomatsu Limited has invested in a major global research project to study this challenge and what leads to effective collaborations in a wide range of fields. Now I would like to introduce our special guests. And I like the, the uh, information that I received. It wasn't about the authors, it was about the contributors. And I think that lends itself to what we're going to be talking about today. Jim Quigley has served as Chief of, of Executive Officer of Deloitte Touche Tomatsu Limited since 2007. Deloitte member firms provide audit, tax, consulting, and financial advisory services to public and private clients in 150 countries and have more than 170,000 employees. Prior to his current role, Jim was the CEO of Deloitte LLP in the United States. Jim is engaged in a number of international business organizations and committees, each working to help shape the policies for a successful and sustainable global economy. He is U.S. co-chairman of the Transatlantic Business Dialogue and a member of the Board of Trustees of the U.S. Council for International Business and the German Marshall Fund of the United States. He is also a member of the Council on Competitiveness, the Shanghai International Financial Advisory Council, and the Yale CELI Board of Advisors. Jim is regularly asked to share his perspective on global business trends and potential challenges at events, such as the annual World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland, where he has participated on several panels with David Gurdon, our center director. Jim received his Bachelor of Science degree and an honorary doctorate of business from Utah State University. He was awarded an honorary degree of Doctor of Commercial Science from Bentley College right here in Waltham, Massachusetts. Murdad Bagai. Murdad is Managing Director of Alchemy Growth Partners, a boutique advisory and venture firm in Sydney, Australia. Murdad has been advising large global companies on growth, organization design, and transformation for the last 20 years. He currently works with clients in North America, Europe, and the Asia Pacific. Murdad is co-author of the international bestsellers, The Alchemy of Growth, and its sequel, The Granularity of Growth. He is currently co-leader of the As One flagship project, the Deloitte Organization's Global Initiative on Collective Leadership. He is also chairman of EMU Technologies, the worldwide leader in authentication and personal identity protection. Murdad is a Henry Crown Fellow at the Aspen Institute. He's a co-founder of the High Resolves Initiative, a community project on global citizenship which has engaged over 15,000 high school students. 
Murdad received his Bachelor of Science in Engineering degree with highest honors from Princeton University. He, but most importantly, he continued his education at Harvard where he completed a master's degree in public policy at the Kennedy School of Government and a Juris Doctor degree with high honors at Harvard Law School. Please join me in welcoming our guests. Well, Donna, thank you. Thank you for that introduction and especially the uh, pedigree of Deloitte, uh, by the way. I'm, I also remember my offer letter. I got, received mine in 1974 and the masthead said Haskins and Sells as well. So I do remember those days and I remember them well. Uh, what we'd like to do with our time, first of all, thank you for being here and for your interest in leadership. We appreciate the privilege of spending a few minutes with you and sharing with you some of what we've learned. And what uh, I'll do is just simply try to outline very broadly what we're going to try to accomplish. We've done, since the book was published, lots of things from a media point of view, lots of things on campuses. And the questions that I seem to get quite consistently are, Jim, why did you go forward with this project? Why did you do it now? And what did you learn? And so what I'm going to do is just simply try to structure our discussion in a way that will answer those questions. So first, why the book? Second, why now? Third, what did we learn? I'm going to turn it over to uh, one of your alums, uh, and certainly someone that I'm very proud to identify myself as a co-author of this product with. And then we'll talk a little bit about what we've done with respect to uh, using this at Deloitte, a little bit about the Deloitte case study, and then we will take your questions. I'm also delighted that Steve Langton uh, has joined us, who is the director of the Deloitte Center for Collective Leadership and is a very key part of what we're doing both in the marketplace broadly as well as what we're doing inside of Deloitte. And so, Steve, thank you for making the journey here from, from the UK. And so let me, uh, in the spirit of just trying to be quite brief to get to that what did we learn and to really be able to then say, and how does that apply in the broad area of public policy? I'm going to do this in somewhat staccato fashion. Uh, first of all, why the book? Uh, I believe in leadership. I've always believed in leadership. I believe passionately about leadership. And what I'm fond of saying is if you told me, Jim, as the CEO of Deloitte, your challenge to take our performance to the next level. And then if you said to me, you only have one lever you can use to try to move Deloitte to the next level. What I would do is choose the lever of leadership. And so in that spirit of trying to then elevate the effectiveness of all of the Deloitte partners in terms of their ability to work as leaders, I began to process of leadership events across the country in the U.S. while I was the U.S. CEO and then continued that uh, outside the U.S. after I obtained the global seat. And what we would do is come together as a group of partners and for 24 hours we would think nothing other than leadership and would really go on a journey of discovery related to leadership. One of those sessions I was holding was in uh, Australia and Merritt happened to be in the room as we worked through this experience. And after we'd finished, he came up to me and he said, Jim, I'd like to continue this conversation on leadership. And so Meredith and I went in a conference room and we went at it for about four additional hours after that initial 24. And what we discovered as we finished that is that we believe fundamentally the same things about leadership, even though we'd come at it from a very different points of view, a different set of experiences. And so Meredith put forward the suggestion that we ought to really launch a project to come at this notion of collective leadership. And so I agreed to think about that and as I flew away from Sydney and then I started to change the cadence of my CEO discussions. And you can imagine if you had my business card with the CEO title and what people attached to that and then the Deloitte brand, you get access to the C-suite. And you can imagine if you were with me, the cadence of that conversation. You walk in, you sit down with the CEO and they say, Jim, you travel constantly. I'm really interested in your outlook on the global economy and you'd sort of kind of imagine what that conversation's like. And then me, since I'm meeting with a client that is very important to us, I want to understand more relationship. So you can imagine that conversation. After my meeting with Meridad, I started to then add a third bullet to those conversations. And I would talk to those CEOs about collective leadership and what they were doing. And so it would go something like this, you know, Mr. Mr. or Ms. CEO, I'm really interested in what you do to deliver your message to your 300,000 people. How do they understand your strategy, the things that you're committed to, and what are you doing to really understand whether they're committed to executing that strategy? And what happened every time is this nice, comfortable, global economy, Deloitte relationship conversation would change. 
Because when you take a leader to the leadership topic and you ask them what they're doing about leadership, every single time forward, they just engage in a much more passionate way and the hour just immediately vanishes on you before you know it. And after about the tenth time I had that experience, I called Meridad back and I said, Meridad, I'm ready to go. Let's fund the project. Let's resource this project. It is enormously C-suite relevant. And thus we began this journey almost three years ago now. So that's the first question. Why this book? Why? It's just the topic of leadership is so relevant, I believe, and so C-suite relevant. And now the question of why now? Uh, you could look at your book, uh, your bookshelves. I sit in my office at, on a Saturday morning at home, and I can look up at the bookshelf, and I can show you, you know, shelves filled with leadership books. I can show you my Churchill books. I can show you my John Wooden books. I can show you, I mean, there's just lots and lots of books on leadership. So why now? Why another view of leadership? And the way that I think about that question is, I think the world is very different than the world was when Jack Welch wrote his books on leadership, or when, and then you fill in the blank. And I don't think the world has changed. I think the world has actually shifted uh, in some very significant ways. And when you look at the events that have unfolded recently, unfolded over time as it relates to technology, as it relates to the emerging markets, as it relates to the shift from the west to the east in terms of economic power. These things cumulatively just lead you to, this is a different world. This is a different world than existed when all of those Churchill books about leadership were written. And if the world has shifted so significantly, maybe it's time for a fresh perspective on leadership. And now just to comment on the events of the most, 20, most recent 24 hours, which we've all witnessed. And perhaps uh, if any of you traveled 12 years ago and then you've traveled in the last couple of days, you know that it's different. And what we do is very different. And uh, David encouraged me just to share just one very brief snippet. And I don't want to lose a lot of time on this. But I do think perhaps it's relevant. And maybe it's relevant in terms of today. Uh, and so in the spirit of leadership and in and the spirit of unusual environments you can find yourself in, on September 11th at 8 a.m. in the morning, I was doing what I did on other uh, morning days. I had a leadership team meeting, and our office was down at the World Financial Center. And um, I remember looking out at the Hudson River, and meeting the conference room was on the third floor, and I remember that, you know, very vividly, I had my team of 25, and we were having a go at the marketplace developments and you know, reporting from individuals and my effort to try to continue to push us. And I remember Mark Kangas came down at about 8.20, maybe 8.25, and he said, Jim, we need you upstairs. And uh, we need you upstairs now. Uh, we don't need you upstairs when you finish this meeting. I need you to come right now. And so I left that room and I went upstairs and uh, I remember as if it were yesterday uh, looking at the CNN screen as I stepped off the elevator and seeing one of the towers on fire and then my co-regional managing partner was over in the conference room and he says Jim look at that you know, you know what do we what's gone on here and what is it that should we should do because we have 3,500 people down at the World Financial Center literally across the street from the World Trade Center and uh, we were just talking about, well, should we give an evacuation order? Uh, and the, you have the Port Authority broadcasting announcements over the PA system of do not evacuate. The incident in an adjacent building does not involve this facility. Do not evacuate. And then one or two minutes later, you almost feel like the building moved. And you heard this very audible concussion and I turned around and looked at the screen, and I saw the fireball come around that second tower as that second plane went in. And we gave the uh, evacuation order, and we began, you take the 10th floor, you take the 9th floor, you take the 8th floor, you take the 7th floor, getting everybody out of our facility. And then the ensuing 24 hours were, um, you know, hours I'll, I'll never forget, and those ensuing weeks and months. and so. These events, when you watch the emotion of people being interviewed down at Ground Zero today, my heart and my mind goes back there. Um, I was there on that day. I know what I experienced. I know what I felt. 
And then in this notion of leadership, and in leadership in environments that you cannot predict. We were, we left the World Financial Center, of course, while all that was being reconstructed. And we moved to 1633 Broadway. And I'll, I'll never forget this a woman, an EA, who was an uh, African-American woman, came down the hall and she said, Mr. Quick, excuse me, can I interrupt you for a minute? And I said, you know, oh, absolutely, I've, I've got time. And she said, I just want to say thank you to you. And, and she was quite emotional. And she just said, I just want to say thank you for your messages on 9-11 and on September 12th, and on September 13th, and on September 14th, she said, your voice was the only thing that I had to hold on to. And hearing from your voice on what we were doing in the aftermath and recovery was just so important to me, but I haven't been able to come see you to say thank you. But I just wanted to say thank you. But that voice of optimism, that voice of hope, that voice of clarity, that voice of direction, that voice of what we're doing was so important to her, but anyway, in the spirit of why a leadership book now, and in the spirit of sometimes things occur that aren't changes, they're fundamental shifts, that's what I believe has happened in the global economy, not just with the events on 9-11, but I believe these economic events that have occurred, I believe the technology developments that have occurred, and all of that led us to believe Now's the time for a fresh look at leadership, and that's why we've proceeded. And now, for the important part of the presentation, what did we learn as a result of this project? I'm going to turn it over to, uh, to Meridad, one of your alums, and we're very proud to be here. Thanks, Jim, very much. Um, I think as you told the story, one of the things that jumps out at me is that, you know, in the crucible of adversity and conflict, um, you know, it calls on people to be leaders, and actually it's often easier to rally a large number of people. But what happens in the day-to-day -day of most organizations when you don't have a rallying cry, when you don't have the thing that's united people? How do you get leaders to try to get normal people uh, to do great things? You know, what, are the, what are the ways you can think about that? And that's really what our research has been about. And I'll start out uh, with a little bit of a definition. Uh, we ended up with this phrase, as one, because it just it felt right. You could put it at the end of almost any verb. Uh, you know, or you could put a noun at the end of it and, you know, as one team, as one company, as one country, uh, or working as one, winning as one, strong, you can put adjectives, stronger as one. It's pretty powerful. At the end of the day for us, it, the definition ended up involving three elements. And those three are still the most powerful parts of the analysis we do. And so the first thing is that it has to involve a group of people, but it's a group of people that is cohesive. So they see themselves as one group. Uh, if they're going to be able to do things together, that's an important element. The second thing is that they have a common goal. They're actually trying to do something, which is a common purpose, goal, vision, strategy. Uh, and the third, often overlooked element, is that they, they know how to work together productively. In other words, it's not just that they have good uh, intentions, they have common purpose, it's that they're actually effective at being able to bring their talents to, to use towards that common aim. And so this became the three-part definition that we've uh, used, and it's still quite valid. And what's interesting for us is that if you take these three dimensions, the who, the what, and the how, we've tried to find ways of measuring them uh, and making it useful for people. So the way we start in terms of testing whether or not a group is cohesive, we use the term shared identity as a measure of whether or not a group sees itself as a group, whether people feel they belong to a particular group. The second, in terms of the what, we test what we call directional intensity, which is a measure of whether people have made a commitment to do the individual actions that are required to create the collective outcome. So it's a measure of individual commitment. Uh, and the third, when we talk about the how, for us it's whether or not people have a common interpretation in their head of how they're supposed to work together. So let me just show you each of these three with uh, just a little bit more detail, and starting with shared identity. Uh, when you start thinking about this concept, for us what was apparent was in most groups, uh, when you look at an individual surrounded by a bunch of other individuals, typically if that's a small group or team, you have a pretty high sense of shared identity. So, you know, you look at the class you're in, uh, if, you're, or if you're in the MPP program, you have a higher identity with the MPP program than you do with the Kennedy School potentially. 
That's typically the way it works. What happens in most organizations, though, is as you zoom out, you, what you begin to notice is that sense of affinity, that sense of belonging gets diluted. Uh, and as the collective gets larger and larger still, you begin to notice then what we call tribes or bands of people uh, with uh, loyalties and identities that are a little bit more mixed. And so part of what we try to do is figure out where is identity highest in an organization? Where are the natural groupings? More importantly, from a leadership prescription point of view, if you're a leader, where do you decide you have to raise that sense of shared identity if you want to get stuff done? The pattern here is typical when on the right side, imagine that's the team level, and as you go up the hierarchy of the organization to the enterprise level, what you typically find is the strength of the identity tends to go down. Uh, in most organizations. There are exceptions. I would bet you that Apple uh, is going to be very high on the left. We know, for example, iconic companies, BBC, uh, Google, you know, we think they're going to be pretty high on the left as well, because people join Google, for example. Um, so what does that pattern look like in most organizations? Well, we know that typically what we're finding is if you look at executive teams, it looks like the left, uh, much more flat, because they are the team. Uh, if you want. If you look in some organizations, you get more mixed up patterns like on the right, where certain levels just don't have that degree of, uh, of belonging for people. What that tells you as a leader, though, is if you're trying to do something at a level at which people don't identify naturally, you're going to have issues. And so you're almost finding out who the most important influencers or leaders in the organization are in terms of being able to link to people's sense of belonging. And if you're trying to do something at a level where shared identity is low, you have to work on some mechanism for increasing that sense of belonging. Let me shift to the second idea, what we call directional intensity. And uh, what we've tried to do to measure here may be best explained using an analogy. And hopefully this will uh, make sense. If you think about a simple task, I've got 30 people, and I'm going to ask them to lift a big table using two fingers. You know, and if you have ever done this exercise, you know that 30 people are very capable of lifting the biggest board table with two fingers if they work together. And what generally happens in the room is some people show up, let's call them the committed people, uh, in dark green, and they're going to try to lift that table. Okay? And those are the people you'd like to have because they're going to try to actually, they've got made the commitment, the individual commitment to act. They're usually accompanied by a group in light green we call supportive, who think it's a great idea for the table to be lifted and they're wholeheartedly behind that idea, but it's not their job to lift the table. Uh, but they will cheer uh, uh, and encourage the, the committed group, but they're just, they're just not there. Most engagement surveys, by the way, uh, put these two groups together. So you actually don't have a, a measure of whether people are going to act. You have a measure of whether people are excited by a direction. Uh, there's a third group in yellow we call undecided. Some may join in, may not, depends on what's happening. They go with uh, the wind. Uh, there's the undecided, uh, un unaware group, which is uh, uh, they didn't get the memo. They've been too busy running around. They just aren't aware that the table was to be lifted today. Uh, and then you've got the most interesting group, the opposed, who don't want that table to be lifted. So part of our view on organizations and the challenge of a leader is this is the reality. Now, what we haven't been able to do is if you could magically shake that organization and try to move those people into a bar chart, that would be great. <laughs> because you'd be able to tell what kind of a challenge you have. And that's what we're trying to do, is to say, if we go into an organization, could we measure what that mix is? And we're finding all kinds of interesting patterns. So the second chart from the left, um, you can see what we call a straddle pattern. You get a chunk of committed and a chunk of undecided. If you were looking at the average, they would come out averaging supportive. But that's not particularly helpful to you. If you know that you've got that large group of undecided, if you can convert them, you're going to be past a tipping point, and some interesting things might happen. The third chart is an actual one from a bank. It's around a specific goal of trying to produce new products faster. And uh, you can see 70% are very supportive of that goal. Do you think they're going to develop new products faster? <laughs> Not unless that 10% that's committed you know, has the ability to make everything happen. So, you can see the power of this as a leader if you can get a sense of whether or not the individuals who are in your group have actually made a commitment and understand what individual action is required of them for the collective outcome to, to happen. The third concept is by far the hardest one. And for us, there wasn't a language around it. There wasn't a frame on it. But if I could explain the core idea, 
I'll borrow an exercise from Steve, which is if you ask the average person, uh, you know, two circles and three lines, what do you see? Some people see trees. And some people, you know, might see balloons. Other people, lollipops. Some people might see a smiley face. The interesting thing is, you know, something as simple as two circles and three lines, you can have a whole raft of views that people have. And yet, we've assumed that we can tell people, we're going to collaborate on this, or I want you to work as one uh, team on this. And we assume that people are going to have the same idea in their head about what that means. And that's just not the case. People are going to react to it like the circles and the lines. And so what we tried to do is to say, can we find a way of uh, analyzing people's minds and saying, what's the mental picture? What's the model that's in their head? Uh, and so the analytics behind our project was all around trying to get to this. And the way we did that, you see the eight archetypes that are in the book, but I'll give you a little bit of the history behind them. Um, again, sorry, I should point out, we, are now, we now, because we did this in a very analytic way, we are capable of measuring this in an organization <laughs> and saying, what's the distribution of different mental models? Do people tend to have a common interpretation of how they want to work together or not? And that really makes a big difference on the efficiency and productivity of people. So let me give you a bit of a background on the research. Uh, we started collecting lots of interesting examples of successful collective behavior. Uh, and they were from all kinds of sources. Uh, they weren't just uh, companies. I mean, you can see Apple there uh, on the left, Marriott, Merck at the bottom. But you know, equally, we have the Dabawalas who deliver lunches in Mumbai. We've got Linux as an operating system. We've got Cirque du Soleil. You know, there's lots of interesting examples of people who are capable of doing this stuff really, really well. And in fact, we collected several dozen. <laughs> And we said, well, what's an interesting way of trying to group them? And the methodology we tried to use uh, involved a realization that the best that we seem to have gotten on classifying here um, leadership seems to be the split between command and control and everything else. So if you read the literature, the idea is you know, command and control is passe. It's the way people used to do it. And now the world is now headed towards this new um, you know, either coordinated, collaborative, uh, empowered, lots of different adjectives that people use. But what, there were two things that bothered us about this. One was that there were plenty of examples of command and control that worked fine today. So there's, you know, it, it's reducing, but it's not dead. Uh, and secondly, um, it seemed like there were an awful lot of different types that were being bucketed together on the right side. And so we felt there was a need to create a much more robust taxonomy. And if you think about how scientists create taxonomies of animals, you look at the different features, and then you say, OK, the first cut is going to be whales that have baleen and tooth whales. So that'll be the first feature that divides them into two groups. And then there'll be another feature, and so on. Uh, so how do you decide what the most important features are? And luckily, Deloitte has uh, an incredibly powerful group of forensic analytic uh, uh, people who are capable of you know, doing amazing stuff. And what we did is we created what's called a self-organizing map, which is a data analytic technique that allows you to do clustering or segmentation without bias. So essentially, we took all our cases, which is uh, you know, somewhere north of 60, and we had uh, about 68 different variables uh, that we looked at for each case. How hierarchical is it? How are people recruited? How are they motivated? Uh, is the leader charismatic? You know, communication up and down or networked. And we threw all that into the map. And the map basically said, you know, there are eight segments. And it also tells you which variables are the most important characteristics of each segment. So it's a very non-biased way of trying to get at an understanding of the groupings. And essentially, what came out for us uh, were these eight archetypes. Uh, people have trouble understanding 68 dimensions. So we reduced it to two. And there were two dimensions that seemed to jump out at us. Uh, you'll also notice that we named the archetypes. You know, the segmentation doesn't name them, but we looked at the characteristics that were linked to each of the archetypes, and we tried to come up with a leader-follower pair that was a metaphor that best captured the essence of what we understood uh, the analysis to be saying. OK, so you can see a bit of a mix here. And what I want to do is just take a second and, and talk you through some of these to share with you a bit of our language around it. Uh, First uh, archetype is in the north position. We call it landlord and tenants. It's a, uh, a model where the landlord has some kind of power, economic power, political power, but some kind of structural power, usually uh, able to leverage that to be much more top-down about the direction of the organization. So if you think of the App Store, 
Apple has a, a base of iPad, iPhone, iPod Touch users, and therefore it can be very attractive to developers by saying, look, here you can develop your apps, uh, you'll get 70% of the revenue, we'll do all the back office stuff, uh, and if your app is good, the market of users say it's good, you're going to make millions. So if you're Rovio and you come up with Angry Birds, and you have well over 100 million downloads at $6 a pop, you know, that's a large number, 400 million or something that comes into your bank account. And that uh, is this market-based way in which it works. Now, Apple can do that because it's got this distribution base. Walmart can do that with suppliers because it's got a distribution base. Um, you can't just decide you want to be a landlord. You actually have to have some tenants uh, in order to be able to act like a, like a landlord. And that's kind of where, where this model comes from. So if you want top-down strategy uh, being set by the landlord, polar opposite of that is in the South. Uh, the power rests with the followers, not the leader. And the leader, at best, is a community organizer that is trying to get these volunteers to agree to do something. So like Linux, trying to get lots of developers around the world to collaborate in creating an operating system. One of the interesting things we've noted is the way you create shared identity uh, in this kind of model is usually a negative message. Uh, so it's much easier to be a community organizer when you're trying to rally people against something. You look at Egypt, it was very easy for everybody to agree that Hosni Mubarak had to go. Uh, it's a lot harder for the Muslim Brotherhood and the military to agree on what the future Egypt should be. You know, it's a lot easier to talk about everything the government does wrong, but when you're in power, it's a lot harder to actually try to make stuff happen. We know that lesson. But one of the interesting things here is the community organizer needs to have a narrative uh, that gets volunteers to opt in. Uh, and therefore, you can't count on them being there. You can't tell them what to do. At best, you can influence them. So you can see here the vertical axis, if you want, is all around power and the ability of the leader uh, to set the agenda directly uh, or, if the leader doesn't have direct power, to have to do it informally in some way. Let me switch to the horizontal axis here. Uh, we start on the west side with conductor and orchestra. This is a model where uh, everything is around precise execution. And uh, so if you like the metaphor, there's notes on musical scores. The members of the orchestra have to play the notes in the order that they appear on the page. You can't improvise. You also have to follow the conductor's baton uh, and uh, all the signals that are coming to you. So if you're basically telling people in incredible detail what they have to do day in, day out, that's this conductor and orchestra model. So it's a micro level archetype, if you want, less about the macro direction, more about the day to day tasks. The example we use is Merck. Uh, about 3,000 pharmacists they use to be involved in delivering health care, uh, the pharmaceutical benefits plans for about 70 million Americans. Uh, they don't want pharmacists to use their personal judgment on when drug drug interactions occur. They have a database of about 10,000 rules and the pharmacists are very clearly on the screen told exactly what they have to do with any given situation. It's a, so this isn't just you know, the Starbucks barista having to follow a particular temperature guideline or the FedEx delivery man. It's, it can occur even in nuclear power plants where lives are at stake or you know, even Medco. So it's an important um, uh, place. And so very, if you want, command and control, but, uh, but important because of the uh, execution things that are required. On the east side, we call it producer creative team, the exact opposite in the sense that people are given huge amounts of autonomy to be creative. Uh, and so if you want the job of a leader as a producer is to assemble the right talent with the right chemistry, the right diversity to be able to innovate. We find dissent is very important here, the ability to you know, say that, no, I don't think this idea is right, let's go this way, and that's how the idea, in fact, gets refined. Uh, Cirque du Soleil is a good example in terms of the way they create the shows. Uh, they have uh, athletes who didn't win the gold medal, who they train in to become artists, and they uh, allow the consultation around their specific talents to be the thing that leads to the theme of the circus that uh, they're going to put on. Interestingly, organizations can go between archetypes. Cirque du Soleil designs shows in, in uh, producer creative team mode. When it comes time to executing the show, they switch to conductor and orchestra. So if you're at a Cirque du Soleil and you see someone slip on a you know, the tight uh, the wire or something like that, believe me that that's something that will happen exactly that way every single night, uh, designed to make you gasp and so on. So it's much more scripted uh, when the creative process ends. 
So you can see this uh, horizontal dimension is much more around the degree of freedom you give people in terms of their tasks, their day-to-day -day tasks. And it's not surprising that the two dominant variables that jumped out of our analysis are power and control uh, in terms of uh, deciding the relationship between leaders and followers. Uh, there are four hybrids. Um, general and soldiers is the traditional command and control model. And so this is top-down strategy translated into day-to-day -day action. It's not the only model in the military. It's the traditional military model uh, and historic one. But the idea here is well-defined tasks, uh, but even more important, hierarchy. Uh, hierarchy as a way of keeping people in the organization and creating career paths uh, and a sense of advancement. Uh, organizing unit, the mission. Uh, and uh, we notice um, a lot of activities around shared identity here, around training, rituals, uniforms, and so on. People who join these organizations join for life. Uh, Marriott's a good example of the way they've used um, uh, second language programs and advancement programs to get immigrant uh, uh, for workforce to stay with them for a very long time. They have uh, unbelievably low employee churn rates, which is really a cost advantage in, in the uh, industry. Uh, architect and builders, one of the rising archetypes we see a lot. Top-down vision, uh, but you need the creative input of lots of different people to make it happen. Think of it as the big project, the moonshot, the uh, opportunity to get major things to happen. Tata Nano, trying to build a $2,000 car. You need you know, hundreds of suppliers to change what, uh, how they work with cars. A different kind of windshield, a different kind of crankshaft. And then you have daily calls. Uh, for the suppliers to inform other suppliers about what they've changed so that they can all stay uh, on the same blueprint because the blueprint is shifting all the time. We see this happening a lot and uh, one of the phrases Jim picked up uh, from Walmex, Walmart Mexico is the idea of freedom within a frame which really describes this model quite well. There's a big audacious goal uh, but then people are given freedom within a frame to make stuff happen. Two other models um, we find captain and sports team extremely high shared identity. Uh, the example we use is uh, the Double Wallace, who deliver lunch, uh, lunches in, in Mumbai, 200,000 lunches a day. Uh, most of them are illiterate, uh, and yet, uh, based on the markings on the lunch pails uh, and the system that they develop to work together, they have a better on-time delivery record than UPS or FedEx or any of those companies, with no technology, really. Uh, and uh, how do they work? Well. We called it captain and sports team because the leader is on the field with the team. It's not the coach and the team, it's the captain and the sports team. And so very non-hierarchical, um, very, it's a model that's very adept and agile. So as circumstances change on the field, people have to adjust uh, and make things happen. So there's no top-down strategy, but there's the playbook and you've been practicing the plays and collectively you know what to do. I don't know, those of you who like basketball, if you would have watched LeBron and Dwayne Wade play together yesterday it was a far cry from the way they played together uh, at the beginning of the year and you know they've learned that fluency of communicating and I hope the Celtics do come back. <laughs> um, Standard and Citizens, our last model, uh, no top-down strategy and no tasking. So you have a participatory democracy. You're giving people a chance to determine their own uh, not just the direction of the company but you know what they do day in day out. We've got companies like Gore where the employees elect the CEO, where they have self-managing uh, teams that make investment decisions, promotion decisions, salary decisions, uh, and very difficult to create, but you know, a bit of an interesting ideal. Um, and uh, the key thing to this is citizens uh, being informed, uh, action-oriented participants, and engaged in it. You can't do this uh, participatory democracy from the top, and you can't uh, just assume that you know, people who are not um, really informed, educated, and engaged are going to be able to make it work. So that gives you a, a bit of a sense um, of, the, of the models. Uh, one of the things that we've tried to do is with the book is share the archetypes and the research uh, out there. Uh, Jim mentioned Steve, who's here. We've created the Center for Collective Leadership uh, based in London to advance this work and continue to go and has a global uh, mandate. Um, if you're interested, asone.org has a lot of the research, a lot of the notes behind it. It also has a little classifier that you could use to test whether the Kennedy School is uh, this archetype or that archetype. There's also a free iPhone and iPad app. If you're interested in this stuff, feel free to download them. 
Uh, so that gives you an overview of, of the research. What we, at the end of the day, what it boils down to for us is um, when a leader asks us, what does it take to get a lot of, large number of people to do something amazing together? For us, it comes down to how do you get them to feel like they belong to the group? Uh, how do you get them to realize that they matter so that they can make the individual commitment to action that they need for this to happen? And what can you do to make sure that their mental model of working together is aligned so that they're not having wildly different aspirations around how to, how to work together? Jim, let me pass it back to you. Okay, good. Thank you, Meredith. Before we open it up for questions, we thought we'd just give you a little bit of a snapshot inside of a Deloitte, a, the Deloitte case study, how we use this tool as part of our strategy refresh. Uh, one of my partners, Karen Ramsey, is uh, in the back on the uh, back row here, and she was part of what we were trying to do in London as part of my Young Partner Advisory Council. And so we used the As One diagnostic to inform a strategy refresh process at Deloitte. And so I'm just, I'm just going to show you two charts, and then we will look forward to your questions. But what I did first was select a relevant population of people that I was going to survey. And so I decided I wanted to take my global executive, so the top 20 people that report to me, and their direct reports. And when you finish with that, you get about 250 people. And then I said, I don't want to just understand what those 250 very senior partners are thinking. I also want to understand what are partners thinking that have a lot of runway still in front of them with respect to our strategy. And so I then added my young partner advisory councils, of which uh, Karen was a part I earlier referred, and then also people on our succession planning list of those that we view as future global leaders in the organization. So I basically had 250 very senior partners and then 250 partners that have lots of runway in front of them. And then what is it that they believe with respect to our strategy and the example that Meredith earlier referred of wanting to have that table lifted? How many were actually committed? How many were supportive? How many were undecided? How many were unaware? And how many were opposed? And so to just illustrate that very first bar was just simply one element of the Deloitte strategy. And so the directional intensity question that we asked these 500 partners was <clears throat> deliver the Deloitte client promise in a borderless fashion every time for every client. And we tried to draft that sentence in a way that it was you know, a little bit challenging, had a little bit of an edge to it, so you actually had to think about it. Am I committed to deliver the Deloitte client promise every time in a borderless fashion? Now, for me, who's a client service maniac, and with my partners, they know I'm passionate about client service, I had every right to assume that if I hand select 500 partners in my survey, knowing how committed I am to client service, I have every right to assume that I'm going to have 98% commitment to my client service component of the strategy. And so what I end up with forcing myself as a leader, when you get inside the minds of these 500 partners, you then come to understand that, well, Jim, you may be passionate about client service. It might be the only thing that you think about. You might think all 10,000 of your partners are absolutely committed to doing what is required to deliver that Deloitte client promise every time in a borderless fashion as one. But what I painfully learned is that's true for 35% of these 500 people. That's how they feel. I'm pleased that I had another 20% that was supportive of somebody else doing that. But that wasn't what it was they were required to do. And then I have to deal with this sort of shocking view that even though I hand selected these 500, even though they know how I feel about client service, even though they know we're a professional services firm where the only thing that really matters almost is client service. It's not quite fair because I am pretty committed to our talent. But shockingly, I've got, you know, another 25 or 30 percent that are undecided. And then perhaps even more shockingly, I have some that are unaware. But what it does for a leader when you're thinking about strategy implementation and strategy execution, when you really, really understand what your people are thinking about these key elements of the strategy, it influences your thinking. It influences the way that you communicate. It influences the tactics. It helps influence your thinking about what level do you want to actually drive strategy implementation actions and where do you need to create accountabilities and where do you need to put you know, real authorities and what do you need to do with respect to your reward structure if you want, in fact, that execution. I can walk you through 
to the other towns or the strategy that I tested through that process. Uh, but I won't do that in the interest of time. And then the, the last thing, Meredith, let's look at that other chart, this notion of what is the model that people want to use to work together? And is there simply one model at Deloitte, or are there people who actually believe that at Deloitte we have multiple models? I might believe that I really want to be the architect, and I might really want the architect and builder model, and it might resonate well with me, because I like to put forward a bold and aggressive goal. And I want to lead my partners in that freedom within a frame idea where I can provide a frame of Deloitte in the context of the values, the culture, the mores, the way things are done around here, but then wanting my partners and my people absolutely empowered to operate within that frame in pursuit of that bold ambition that we're seeking to accomplish as a professional services firm. And so I love the architects and builders mode, but it actually is helpful a strategy implementation to understand that not everybody's with me on architect and building. Some actually would prefer some of these other models. And whenever you end up with a leader follower misalignment with respect to the model, then you're going to have an impact. That's going to have an impact on the degree of commitment that the organization has to strategy execution. And so by informing the leader of the multiple points of view inside the organization, and this is an effort at trying to paint a picture of what is the model that they believe they're experiencing at Deloitte? And then we also ask them, what is it that you would like to experience? And we see that those much more collaborative, much more participative models, those circles get a little bit larger when you look at it from the perspective of the desired. And then importantly, I think it's uh, inside an organization, it isn't, you're not going to have a single model that applies to every business process that you try to drive. Uh, when we met with John Chambers at Cisco, he was quite proud of saying that he thinks of himself in a producer and creative team mode when they're working to innovate new product offerings that they want to take to the market of Cisco. But after they commit the capital and they're now ready to take a product to market, he absolutely becomes general and soldiers in terms of the way that he thinks, the way that he operates, the way that he tries to drive that behavior. And then I like to also illustrate that point with just two other examples. If you were leading a financial services institution, what is the model you would use to try to drive regulatory compliance? And how tolerant would you be of exceptions? And I believe you'd want Six Sigma performance as it relates to regulatory compliance. And I think you'd have perhaps a conductor and orchestra approach to that business process or that business model. And then in the notion of is command and control dead, is that past? Is that a model that once existed before we enjoy the technology platforms that we have? We actually believe that those highly directive models have their place. And the way that I like to illustrate it, I could take you back to 9-11, but would have to be a little bit worried there that I would become more emotional than you'd want to deal with or that I'd be comfortable with. But when we give the evacuation order, we don't say, you know, these two towers right across the street from us are burning. Something bad is going on here. Maybe we ought to get some focus groups going. Let's see if we can do some brainstorming over in this conference room on what are the options? What are the things that we should do now? And maybe we ought to really be collaborative and let's try to get some social media going to really have this be highly democratic and highly participative. And you realize the ridiculousness of that example, because in that environment, you want to be very directive and you want to be very clear. And so I think that those highly directive models absolutely have their place. Certainly in the crisis mode, the highly directive uh, is essential. But I also believe, as I said earlier, that in my case, I've got a business that is regulated. What is the degree of compliance that I should have in my regulated business? And I believe I should hold myself to a Six Sigma kind of standard. I should be pushing in a zero defects kind of way. And to do that, you have to be quite scripted, quite directive with respect to those individual activities. But I found as a client of my As One flagship client initiative that this was enormously valuable to me as I was working to refresh my strategy and as I'm working thinking through its communication, its execution, and the accountabilities that we want to drive as we continue to move for the specific strategy implementation, ambition, realization of vision that we have in mind.
But that would be my effort at a very brief uh, case study. Our world meeting in London was a highly engaged, highly collaborative experience built around our thinking in as one. And I'm proud of how we're performing and the progress that we're making. But it is taking these ideas and now trying to make them real. So as Meridad pointed out, as one, those two very simple words can change the meaning of everything. And what I believe is my ambition for Deloitte, clear, undisputed leadership in professional services, needs a really big idea in order to realize that vision. And that big idea is as one. And what I believe is if Deloitte can behave as one in a borderless fashion, we'll be unlike any other professional services firm that exists. And we'll be able to also outperform them. And that's what I believe that this concept has the potential of enabling and why I remain so passionate about it when I look just focus at the Deloitte case study. Thanks, Jim. I think um, we were going to take, we have a hard close at 1030. And we have a few books to give away before that. But I think there's some time for a good discussion. And I think there's a mic there in the middle if you want. I don't think I'll need it. Sir, uh, Mark Sir, I'm a National Security Fellow, Air Force Aviator. I appreciate your talk, and it's very interesting. Uh, I question for you in terms of modeling. Have you uh, thought about modeling or ever modeled any of the governments, and including our own government, uh, particular uh, in the condition we're in right now, where we kind of have two parties that are kind of separating, and we have a kind of a crisis situation that we're approaching in terms of our deficit uh, and, and debt? Have you ever thought about modeling, and where would you put them on your uh, on your circular spectrum of uh, of the as one model? So I'll, we have a session after this um, where we're going to look at the results from uh, some work we did in, in the Australian public sector. And we applied this to uh, about uh, just under 300 leaders from the federal and state governments, as well as the nonprofit sector. And I, I'll go through the details of that during that small session, because we'll actually you know, go through the data and show you what comes out. Um, so let me give a more generic uh, response. I think I have no doubt that this applies as equally to leaders in the, non, in the nonprofit and public sector as it does to the, the leaders in the private sector. And uh, that the, um, everything in terms of shared identity, directional intensity, and the archetypes can help them be better uh, leaders in the public sector. I think if you're asking about the US in general, um, you know, I've lived here a long time. I now live in Australia. And so um, if, watching what's happening in the country uh, and how it's changed over the last 20 years from an external vantage point. Um, I think what's interesting is that um, that sense of shared identity has, I think that's where you start, and that's where the deterioration's most taken place. Uh, whereas uh, you know, there were times when I think people were American first. I get the sense that people are Republican and Democrat first, uh, American second, and even then maybe Tea Party and you know, whatever the adjective is on the other side, Republican first, then Republican, then American. You know, so there, there's a, um, a fragmentation in terms of that identity, or if you want, our, our identity curve as a nation is sloped down. Um, interestingly, uh, we were talking about this at breakfast, the things that uh, are moments when you can create the greatest shared identity is adversity. Uh, and, you know, the aftermath of 9-11 was one of those opportunities where, you know, everyone in the world was American uh, for a, a week or two. Uh, and there was an incredible opportunity if you want to build on that unity, that sense of shared identity. Maybe that exists today uh, in some ways. And it's interesting to see whether people can t uh, take that up. I'll make one other point with respect to that, which is that what we've discovered when you don't have that sense of shared identity and when people don't institutionally belong you almost by default end up in community organizer volunteer because the leader can't assume to have authority or influence you know, even. Um, and so what are the things that work as a community organizer? You have to realize that people aren't going to jump into big things. They're going to agree to one thing. So what you need to do is convince them, figure out what's the one thing you want to do together and then what's the next thing you want to do together. You, know, you sort of have to build it up. The other thing is that in that situation, negative messages always are stronger than positive messages. Uh, and you know, change we can believe in might have been a slogan that worked two years ago. It'll be difficult for it to work now, I think. Uh, and negative messages have a very strong chance of working uh, because people don't have to agree on what's next. They just have to agree that they don't like today. So if there's a question around, are you better off today than you were two years ago, it's a very difficult 
question, I think, uh, for the Democrats. I hope we get to the point of being able to converge on some ideas that won't be so partisan in terms of the way that uh, we behave. I'm an optimist, and I think we're going to get there. I think it was Churchill. David can correct me on this. I might not be remembering this. But he says the U.S. always does the right thing after they've exhausted every other option. <laughs> and uh, I believe that with respect to the point you raised on the deficit, uh, I think we're on an unsustainable path. And things that aren't sustainable won't be sustained. And so we will decide that we have exhausted every other option. And then I think we will come together and we will do the right thing. But we're, but we're not there quite yet uh, by any stretch. But I'm hopeful. Please. Uh, Warren Gary from the CPL. I'm interested if you could help me understand how your methodology here dovetails with the difference from two uh, dominant trends in the way leading teams have been taught here at the Kennedy School for the last decade, and then also some familiarity over with uh, how the Sloan School of Management is taught. Uh, first off, at the Kennedy School, it's uh, Richard Hackman's structural approach that looks at what he calls inputs to a team, norms, mission, resources, as the first move that you do in setting up a team and ensuring that it's aligned, shared identity. And then work over at uh, Deborah Ancona's work over at MIT on what she calls X teams is really emphasizing increasingly for uh, for uh, teams in the 21st century organizations the need for an external focus that you are not that the most productive teams are not just internally focused but are really scouting outside uh, serving as ambassadors uh, to find resources for the work etc. Can you help me understand where your approach here aligns with that? And, and it's both. Yeah, um, I'll take a shot at it. Might add a third one, which is the MIT Center for Collective Intelligence with Tom Malone, which has one other model. Yep. So one of the things that we tend to find in common with a lot of these models is that they end up focusing on a set of levers that are particularly effective in a uh, special circumstance. And we sort of see what we've done more is if you want the general theory uh, and then if you want, they, you know, they can zoom in. So a lot of times when you hear the language of teams, they're talking about small groups. You know, so <clears throat> that's different than saying what happened in Tahrir Square. That wasn't a team. Uh, it was you know, a movement or something like that. So if you want, our theory includes everything from 170,000 people at Deloitte to trying to get you know, 20 people in my you know, creative design team to work better together. So. Um, uh, and if you want, sometimes when you zoom into special cases, you can then you know, get much more specific about the levers that you pull. I think if you analyze the levers you were describing, uh, they will line up with a lot of the things we would talk about in terms of how do you create shared identity, uh, you know, things like mission norms. You know. Now, what's in also interesting is the archetypes that we have. If you have a sense of the archetypes that people are entering the room with, it'll give you some pretty interesting clues on um, how you emphasize those things. So I'll just give you one illustrative example. Um, sometimes when you're talking about purpose, you know, you sort of say the directional intensity, our theory, how do you get people to agree on a direction? Well, a direction for landlord and tenant is different than what a direction is in senator and citizen, or community organizer and volunteer, or architect and builder. Um, I have one CEO uh, operating a global business in about 48 countries. And his group is predominantly architect and builders. And you look at the feedback from their last uh, conference, and it's very clear people don't want to have syndicate breakout sessions. Uh, why don't they want to do that? Because they're architect and builders. They just don't want to know what the direction. They want to know the, the frame. Tell us what it is. We don't want to talk about it. <laughs> we just want to know what we have to contribute to it. And so if you wanted to do a high degree of norming and values discussion, and you know, let's collectively come up with a strategy for a group that's architect and builder, you'd lose them. You know, you, you'd totally lose them. And that's, in fact, what they've been doing in the design of the sessions, is taking out uh, and repurposing the breakouts to be something else. Switch to another company where they were trying to do innovation, but they put it more as a, you know, here's the goal, let's go do it. And they had a high percentage, 55%, senator, citizen, community organizer, volunteer. Well, those people don't do anything unless you tell them why. You know, why innovation? What, why is this an important thing for us? And remember, I have to choose to you know, convince me. So part of, I think, what our lens is doing is to say, look, 
there may be these prescriptions that work in special circumstances. Part of what we want to do is help people decide what the right path is. And so one of the things we haven't done is we don't have a leadership book that you open and it says, here's seven great things John Wooden did, or you know, here's seven great things all leaders do, that sort of thing. For us, it's much more situational. Let's understand what the external situation is and what archetypes and things fit it best. Let's understand how the people are coming in and let's try to be much more analytical and um, granular about the set of leadership actions we're choosing to take. Better. Please. Yeah, I was wondering if you could say a little bit about the, uh, the cultural differences. You know, um, I would imagine that attitudes to hierarchy are very different to you know, yeah. sort of the West compared to Asia, and also maybe generational changes as well. I mean, how, how do millennials view the sort of command and control versus you know, more yeah. autonomy? I'll say one thing. I mean, it's great that we have Steve here because one of the things that the Center for Collective Leadership is doing is as we run more and more of these diagnostics for large organizations, public and private sector, the data is going, and Steve has one person on his team whose job includes looking at whether there are interesting trends across these. I think at this point, our database is not big enough to, for us to confidently and, you know, in a, in a way that we would publish, talk about these, but I can give you some impressions. Uh, so this is just impressionistic uh, reactions. One thing that we're seeing generally is theory would say women are more affiliative. And so you'd expect, um, hypothesis would be women should have higher shared identity scores than men. In fact, they have significantly lower shared identity scores in organizations than men. They also have lower directional intensity scores in general. Not all organizations, but in general. That's what we're seeing. Again, impressionistic early, but you can see how powerful that uh, is going to be once we have enough data to be able to actually make a, a pronouncement on it. Uh, in terms of young, in terms of age, one of the trends we're seeing is in a lot of the organizations, when young people join, their sense of shared identity is high for the first six months. Okay, If you look at people in the first year to six months, after that it drops. That, so the people who are in their second year have the lowest shared identity, typically. And then it sort of climbs steadily back up. Uh, you get to the highest point in the you know, 50 to 60, some organizations 40 to 50 range. And then it dips again after that for the people who are sort of 60 plus. So you do get a, a, an interesting link that way. Is there an affinity to a particular model? You'd think you'd see some of the tribal stuff, uh, like captain sports team, center citizen, be more popular with, uh, with young people. I don't think we've seen enough data to say that there's a link one way or the other at this point. I don't know whether more recently Steve has there. No, I think one of the things that is uh, perhaps not surprising but is delightful is how much around the world we use this data. And we've done it in countries across South America, North America, Asia, Africa. Uh, there are patterns that let you pick different races or different cultures whether they're third world or first world or different states of economic inclusion, um, they're just humans voicing. Um, and it's interesting when you look at age, and we want to assume that we've got whole areas of Lloyd which are advising on this concept of Gen Y and the difference that we have to uh, tolerate, accept, embrace because of a new generation. Um, one speaker I've just listened to talked about Gen Y2K. Does it even exist at all, even though we're spending so many millions on it? Um, is there really evidence that they're anything different? You go to uh, organizations that are uh, the police academies, uh, the military academies uh, of the world, um, those behaviors aren't apparent there, they're anything different than they always have been. But when you look at our data when we're using it, um, there isn't an apparent difference in the behavior of ages. But it's so easy to correlate that to the length of time they've had in the organization. And there are differences in tenure in companies. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean it's the age. You can be in a company for only a year and be in your 50s. We assume so easily that people have been in the company for a year in their 20s. Now, with tenure, you get a difference. As Mir that's saying, we, we join under the, the aspiration of what this new organization is going to be. I read the website. Look at my job description. It was, it was so well sold that I have this high identity. And then we go into this slightly uh, sneaky suspicion that all wasn't all there. And down comes identity <coughs> about the, 
year three, year four, year five, and then up it comes again once they give us promotion. Um, so identity does link to tenure much more than age. We'd love to find some differences where we can really start focusing on different nations, cultures, and races, and ages. But actually, they don't seem to be there. This is more anthropology now than some business hypothesis. Yeah, just one last comment on the, on the cultural. I, I was surprised. I was in Hanoi with a CEO of a organization that had about a billion dollars in revenue. And I think the client team, they were very worried that I was going to have an as one conversation with the CEO, and they were sort of starting with this notion that this is very much a Western idea, so this isn't going to resonate in Hanoi. The team was fascinated, because when I started the as one discussion, that CEO leaned forward, and we had to go at it just like every other time. Uh, we've, we've come at it, and I'll, I'll never forget at one moment I was illustrating some of the archetypes I made reference to Nelson Mandela or Gandhi and what they had done. And he said, well, Jeff, I absolutely agree with the point that you're making. And when I reflect on leaders who I think really made a difference, he said, I think of Ho Chi Minh. And I have huge respect for Ho Chi Minh and for what he did and the way in which he had you know, organized the Vietnamese people. But the point I came away with was the timeless leadership challenge doesn't exist only in a Western culture. That timeless leadership challenge of the ability to bring together a group of people, a diverse group of people, create an environment for them to work together effectively to accomplish a shared goal, that works across all the cultures, as Steve has pointed out. Other questions? Please. Quickly, you haven't mentioned the word brand throughout all of that. It was, it was intentional, but it's going, how, what is the role of branding in your model? Um, I believe brand was one of the 60 plus variables we used. It just didn't come across as one of the strong differentiators. Um, so just hasn't jumped out. You'd expect stronger shared identity in an organization where the brand is enormously powerful than you might have otherwise. But we haven't tried to go through the shared identity analysis for Apple and then compared that with another enterprise that perhaps brand isn't quite as strong. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I mean, there's strong brands in every one of those archetypes. That's the interesting. Right. Please. Uh, hi, I'm Bob Eckel. I'm from the business school. And I teach the course on professional service firms. So your ambition for Deloitte is interesting. Um, and in terms of the archetypes, do you think it's kind of a follow on to this discussion? Do you think there's any differences, or would you expect differences between your audit or assurance practice and your consulting practice? And would you expect differences between managing people that are primarily kind of internally focused versus people that are kind of client focused, because that's one of the big differences in professional service firms. Uh, Steve, any insights from the, the many analysis we've done of individual member firms by both by function and then also whether or not their fundamental value proposition is client service as opposed to leadership and management? Anything that you've seen as we've looked at that that you could add? Yeah, and um, I was lucky enough to be taught by Bill last year, so I will actually think it's that we're trying to understand, forgive my back, um, we're trying to understand the idea, of, uh, and it links into the question here about brand. I mean, where do people put their emphasis? Where do they actually cling to? And uh, I don't think it's giving up too many uh, questions with, uh, or secrets. In our own firm, we find our leaders, our partners, our top leaders around our firm, are very much more identifying with the locations where they touch the market and not where they're touching the organization itself. Uh, there's a sense of engagement, there's a sense of joint celebration, there's a sense of local achievements attached to moving into where the client is, where the market is, far more than in the functional side. The only time you see in our data where the functional side goes up is in the top management team. And you get this spike amongst what those when we survey just the top team members as well as survey those below them. And at the top team level, the head of HR, the head of finance, the head of marketing, does have a spike under that functional side, which is, yeah, I absolutely identify with it. I used to be on my business card, so I introduced myself. And there's something very individualistic about it. But it's not where power happens, in, uh, where the self-esteem of power in the organization happens in the client place. Very apparent in our own data around that. Um, so I think that's where we're going to, you know, for instance, how do we use that for ourselves? It's about getting engagement, generating strategy, communicating strategy from where the client is power rather than where our own internal power lies. 
Any, anything, Meredith, on the audit versus tax versus consulting yeah. that you've seen? Um, so three of the archetypes are particularly useful for execution, day-to-day -day execution. And that's general and soldier, conductor and orchestra, and captain and sports team. But they're different types of um, execution. In Australia, part of what we're beginning to discover is that um, you could have different parts of the firm rely on each, any of those three. Typically, the way it's worked is the ones that have a real process-intensive thing like audit and risk would be what we call conductor and orchestra because it's about precise execution. Uh, and then if you look at the others, uh, the ones that are better performing, let's say, more mature, we try to shift to captain and sports team because it's much more agile, responsive to market. The ones that are a little bit, you know, need to get their act in order, a bit more general and soldier, just, you know, here's what we need to do. You do this, you do this, you do that. So it's a mix. I'd like to come back to the question that was asked, the first question about how one changed or state of a nation when we talked about the United States. The, a lot of material here is very diagnostic and very helpful and compelling about how organizations work. The question is how do you change organizations? And, and the question here is if you have a fragmented society as we do now, a polarized society, how do you create, how do leaders create a greater sense of identity that allows them to go on and do these other things? It's a great question, right? And uh, so I, I don't think we can presume to have all the answers, but let me share a few thoughts, Jim. Steve, I'm sure we'll have some ideas to add as well. Um, I would start with this notion that I think it helps to build the shared identity. That's the, the door that you want to start to come in on. And so things that allow Americans to feel good about themselves again uh, and to feel good about being American are, have to be high on the list. You know? And part of that is things like you know, um, related to, say, 9-11 and going on things like that. Part of it is related to things like even sports, national mood. But at the end of the day, for me, it has to come back to economics. You know, people need that on the Maslow hierarchy. You feel good if you feel like you're winning and you've got the basics kind of taken care of. Uh, and I think the challenge is, um, from a job creation point of view, there isn't a single industry in the U.S. that's capable of generating anywhere close to the number of jobs we need to kind of get in economic growth going. I believe the discussions around the White House have been more around, you know, should the U.S. begin to think of itself as 15 to 20 regional economic strategies? Uh, and the industries that are going to create jobs in the Southwest might have to do with clean tech and, you know, algal oil and things like that, that's very different than what's going to revitalize New England, for example, or the Pacific Northwest. And being able to create, you know, very specific regional strategies that allow those pockets to start feeling good about themselves might be a way of actually creating it. So I think it's kind of a counterintuitive answer, uh, which is, you know, you'd expect someone to say, well, we need to do things that are going to make everyone feel good about being American. I think part of the answer is we have to actually start making people feel good. Um, and confident, and then as part of that, the bigger SI will fall. The downward spiral is that if people feel badly done, they're not willing to come together, say, deal with the deficits, deal with the debt. Yeah. And, and the burden just grows. Yeah. And, and then people feel worse. Yeah. And so and, and how do you find a way to snap out of it? I mean, yeah. the capture, or, and the killing of Osama bin Laden gave us a brief moment when everybody came together. Yeah. Like we had this longer moment in 9-11. Yeah. It's very, very unclear how one creates a, something that is sustainable yeah. about feeling proud and feeling identified. Yeah, that's the, yeah. That, that's the essence of the political debate right now, for sure, that's going on as we watch the Republicans try to decide their direction and the Democrats, what are the ideas they're going to get behind. But that, that is the big question in the country right now. Steve, please go ahead. Yeah, no, we just, and it's very timely because we've just hosted in our, in our centre in London a gathering of leaders who are close to the firm as well as some of the academic advisors we have and asking that question, which is how do you, because actually there's, that's the intangible here, a concept of individual moving into a collective identity. And the brainstorm came into, into everything came down to three drivers. And, and it wasn't how well you could do one of them. It's the fact you had to do all three simultaneously or it won't happen. And those simple drivers are the past, present, and the future. There's something about expressing the past which not just creates but rekindles identity. It's who we were, what we used to be. Um, and let's celebrate that past in mythology and legends and history. And, uh, and, and how do we build that into the rituals and traditions that we've had? 
because those are decaying things in the modern world. So it's the past has a symbol of means of demonstrating through stories who we were and why we came together in the first place, because that's so forgotten. I think in the music world, it's the bands that break up because I remember when it was all about the music. And then things change and success <laughs> happens and we move on. Then there's, there's definitions about the present. And the present is what are we doing today? Forget the past, because so many times organizations are seen as fraudulent. You hired me here on what you have been doing and I got here and you're not doing it. So we need to be very clear about today's tasks expressed as, as values, not just as outcomes to have people believing that it's important. Um, and there's a whole cascade of, of practical things leaders need to do. But the most powerful is the one that sits on top of these two together, which is the future. A sense of purpose, a sense of need, making people feel they're important to something that transcends what they're doing as individuals. Pride is something we've judged for too many decades. Uh, and allowing people to come back and having pride as an outcome brings us back into the world of brand, what we're standing for. Because once you kindle that idea, and it's, in fact it's a big area we're advising boards on, because today what people are doing become tomorrow's legends and myths and they actually start to embed it. Um, the uh, institutions like the CIA, for instance, uh, like the SAS, they have walls with people's names on them. What those people did is forgotten. The fact that they were humans in this organization puts a sense of awe and inspiration into the next person that joins. And what we have to do as leaders is move away from allowing the next individual to be their own sense of purpose and identity, that all they are is, is transcended by everything that's happened before. And we're learning how to do that in the way CEOs and leaders communicate, how they engage their organizations, and how I engage the phrase we use, which is the jury the jury who judge that organization, customers, shareholders, publics, communities, um, and everybody else's employees. Um, and when we can start to do that deliberately, we're seeing that we're able to influence a shared identity in a very deliberate way. Do we have more time? One, one more? We, we can go here or there. How about if we do two more? One here, and then that, you'll have the last question back here. Please. I think it would be accepting the notion that leadership is this timeless challenge. It exists at every level of the organization. And what I want is I want my senior consultants to be able to bring teams together and get the very best from those teams. And one of the ways that you can do that is by having alignment in terms of how that team wants to work and how you want to operate together. And then also accepting as we're advising and assisting clients that leadership is an art and it's a science. And some things that matter can be measured. And that's what our diagnostic is all about. But I think it is accepting the notion that leadership, it's interesting what Quigley does as the CEO of Deloitte. But I think it's dramatically more interesting what 10,000 Deloitte partners do in terms of the impact on the organization. And then what I think really matters at Deloitte is what do 170,000 client service professionals do as they're delivering value to clients? And can we, in fact, do those things as one? my aspiration, my desire, my goal, my challenge. Because when that teamwork exists and you serve Deloitte clients with the very best thinking of Deloitte, I challenge any professional services firm to match the value we can deliver. Last question. Can someone go back to the question about how David's question and the answer about the unchanged? When you talk about um, past, present, future, I actually think that the present is actually growing. The audience and all of the speakers from the
You know, I, I think that is the big question for sure. That's the big question in the political debate today, and that's the big question for us as a country. And can we actually come together around something other than a common enemy? Can we actually come together around a shared ambition or a shared aspiration or a desire for what it is that we have the potential of doing? And can we overcome the polarization that our politics creates? And can we, in fact, become, as Meridad suggested right at the beginning, can we become again Americans first? Instead of feeling that I have to first be a Republican, or I first have to be a Democrat, or I first have to be a member of the Tea Party, regardless of what we collectively feel about the Tea Party, and each one of us would have our own strong views about that on one side or another, and I'm not trying to take sides there. I'm just simply saying they've tried to come together around a single idea. And they've been able to bring a whole bunch of people towards a single idea. And would it be possible for, we, you know, I'm, we can have one president at a time. Uh, I'd love to have President Obama be enormously successful. We're all better off if we can do that. And can he, because he is a great charismatic speaker, he is as good as we've ever had as a charismatic speaker. But can he then bring us together around some ideas that we all share and that we're ready to be committed for their execution? Because as Meridad illustrated on our two fingers to lift the table example, on almost any idea in this country, you're going to have some that are ready to help lift that table, and you're going to have some who are going to do everything in their God-given power to prevent that table from being lifted. And is it possible for us to decide what are those ideas that we're going to come together? I certainly hope that we decide one of the things that we're going to be able to come together on is just the economic reality of deficits that are not sustainable. We're going to realize that can't be sustained at some moment. And instead of arguing that, well, the only solution is tax increases on this group of people for one group of people who come at that idea from that perspective, and then another group of people who come at that idea and say the only way we can get at that is by cutting these costs. Somehow, somewhere, sometime, we're going to have to come to an idea that we're going to be ready to execute. And I think that is the great hope. And I think that Winston Churchill is right. We're going to do the right thing after we've tried everything else. And we might be actually getting to the point where we've tried everything else. Thank you very much. This has been uh, fun for us. ...to public and private clients in 150 co countries and have more than 170,000 employees. Prior to his current role, Jim was the CEO of Deloitte LLP in the United States. Jim is engaged in a number of international business organizations and committees, each working to help shape the policies for a successful and sustainable global economy. He is U.S. co-chairman of the Transatlantic Business Dialogue and a member of the Board of Trustees of the U.S. Council for International Business and the German Marshall Fund of the United States. He is also a member of the Council on Competitiveness, the Shanghai International Financial Advisory Council, and the Yale CELI Board of Advisors. Jim is regularly asked to share his perspective on global business trends and potential challenges at events, such as the annual World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland, where he has participated on several panels with David Gurdon, our center director. Jim received his Bachelor of Science degree and an honorary doctorate of business from Utah State University. He was awarded an honorary degree of Doctor of Commercial Science from Bentley College, right here in Waltham, Massachusetts. Murdad Bagai. Murdad is Managing Director of Alchemy Growth Partners, a boutique advisory and venture firm in Sydney, Australia. Murdad has been advising large global companies on growth, organization design, and transformation for the last 20 years. He currently works with clients in North America, Europe, and the Asia Pacific. Murdad is co-author of the international bestsellers, The Alchemy of Growth, and its sequel, The Granularity of Growth. He is currently co-leader of the As One flagship project, the Deloitte Organization's Global Initiative on Collective Leadership. He is also chairman of EMU Technologies, the worldwide leader in authentication and personal identity protection. 
Murdad is a Henry Crown Fellow at the Aspen Institute. He's a co-founder of the High Resolves Initiative, a community project on global citizenship which has engaged over 15,000 high school students. Murdad received his Bachelor of Science in Engineering degree with highest honors from Princeton University. He, but most importantly, he continued his education at Harvard where he completed a master's degree in public policy at the Kennedy School of Government and a Juris Doctor degree with high honors at Harvard Law School. Please join me in welcoming our guests. Well, Donna, thank you. Thank you for that introduction and especially the uh, pedigree of Deloitte, uh, by the way. I'm, I also remember my offer letter. I got, received mine in 1974 and the masthead said Haskins and Sells as well. So I do remember those days and I remember them well. Welcome on behalf of the Center for Public Leadership. My name is Donna Calico and I'm the Executive Director of the Center for Public Leadership. Our mission is to advance the frontiers of knowledge about leadership and to deepen the pool of men and women who will lead for the common good. Today's leadership session will meet both of those goals for all of us. Before I introduce our special guests, Jim Quigley, CEO of Deloitte Touche Tomatsu Limited, and Murdar Bagai, Managing Director of Alchemy Growth Partners, I wanted to share my own personal and professional connection with Deloitte. I'm a Deloitte alumni, served, and I served in the former office of Haskins and Zells from 1973 to 1977 in Boston. I was the first woman to be promoted to senior accountant, and I'm a CPA. Mm -hmm. It was the best training ground I could have ever had. When I worked there, you were evalu evaluated not only on your professional competence, but also on how well you trained your people. I believe those values have shaped the foundation and principles Deloitte is known for today, promoting leadership, encouraging women to lean in, and embracing cultural diversity. But I don't want you to think that a public accounting firm was all work and no play. I met my husband, Marty Calico, at Haskins and Sells. <laughs> he worked in the tax department and I worked in the audit department. And I'm proud to say that we will be celebrating our 34th anniversary this week on May 6th. <laughs> so even love can flourish there. <laughs> As one, individual action, collective power. One of the most formidable challenges of business leaders and all leaders today is getting large groups of people to work productively towards a common purpose. For the past two years, Deloitte Touche Tomatsu Limited has invested in a major global research project to study this challenge and what leads to effective collaborations in a wide range of fields. Now I would like to introduce our special guests. And I like the, the uh, information that I received. It wasn't about the authors, it was about the contributors. And I think that lends itself to what we're going to be talking about today. Jim Quigley has served as Chief of, of Executive Officer of Deloitte Touche Tomatsu Limited since 2007. Deloitte member firms provide audit, tax, consulting, and financial advisory services. It existed when all of those Churchill books about leadership were written. And if the world has shifted so significantly, maybe it's time for a fresh perspective on leadership. And now just to comment on the events of the most, 20, most recent 24 hours, which we've all witnessed. And perhaps uh, if any of you traveled 12 years ago and then you've traveled in the last couple of days, you know that it's different. And what we do is very different. And uh, David encouraged me just to share just one very brief snippet, and I don't want to lose a lot of time on this, but I do think perhaps it's relevant, and maybe it's relevant in terms of today. Um, and so in the spirit of leadership and in and the spirit of unusual environments you can find yourself in, on September 11th at 8 a.m. in the morning, I was doing what I did on other uh, morning days. I had a leadership team meeting, and our office was down at the World Financial Center. And um, I remember looking out at the Hudson River 
and the meeting of the conference room was on the third floor, and I remember that, you know, very vividly. I had my team of 25, and we were having a go at the marketplace developments and, you know, reporting from individuals and my effort to try to continue to push us. And I remember Mark Kangas came down at about 8.20, maybe 8.25, and he said, Jim, we need you upstairs. And uh, we need you upstairs now. Uh, we don't need you upstairs when you finish this meeting. I need you to come right now. And so I left that room and I went upstairs and uh, I remember as if it were yesterday, uh, looking at the CNN screen as I stepped off the elevator and seeing one of the towers on fire. And then my co-regional managing partner was over in the conference room. He says, Jim, look at that. You know, you know what do we, what's gone on here? And what is it that should, we should do? Because we have 3,500 people down at the World Financial Center, literally across the street from the World Trade Center. And uh, we were just talking about, well, should we give an evacuation order? Uh, and do you have the Port Authority broadcasting announcements over the PA system of do not evacuate, the incident in an adjacent building does not involve this facility, do not evacuate. And then one or two minutes later, you almost feel like the building moved and you heard this very audible concussion. And I turned around and looked at the screen and I saw the fireball come around that second tower as that second plane went in. And we gave the uh, evacuation order and we began you take the 10th floor, you take the 9th floor, you take the 8th floor, you take the 7th floor, getting everybody out of our facility. And then the ensuing 24 hours were, um, you know, hours I'll, I'll never forget. And those, to think about that, and as I flew away from Sydney, and then I started to change the cadence of my CEO discussions. And you can imagine if you had my business card with the CEO title and what people attach to that, and then the Deloitte brand, you get access to the C-suite. And you can imagine, if you were with me, the cadence of that conversation. You walk in, you sit down with the CEO, and they say, Jim, you travel constantly. I'm really interested in your outlook on the global economy. And you'd sort of kind of imagine what that conversation's like. And then me, since I'm meeting with a client, that is very important to us. I want to understand more about your relationship. So you can imagine that conversation. After my meeting with Meridad, I started to then add a third bullet to those conversations. And I would talk to those CEOs about collective leadership and what they were doing. And so it would go something like this, you know, Mr. Mr. or Ms. CEO, I'm really interested in what you do to deliver your message to your 300,000 people. How do they understand your strategy, the things that you're committed to, and what are you doing to really understand whether they're committed to executing that strategy? And what happened every time is this nice, comfortable, global economy, Deloitte relationship conversation would change. Because when you take a leader to the leadership topic and you ask them what they're doing about leadership, every single time they forward, they just engage in a much more passionate way and the hour just immediately vanishes on you before you know it. And after about the 10th time I had that experience, I called back and I said, Meridad, I'm ready to go. Let's fund the project. Let's resource this project. It is enormously C-suite relevant. And thus we began this journey almost three years ago now. So that's the first question. Why this book? Why? It's just the topic of leadership is so relevant, I believe, and so C-suite relevant. And now the question of why now? Uh, you could look at your book, uh, your bookshelves. I sit in my office at, on a Saturday morning at home, and I can look up at the bookshelf, and I can show you, you know, shelves filled with leadership books. I can show you my Churchill books. I can show you my John Wooden books. I can show you. I mean, there's just lots and lots of books on leadership. So why now? Why another view of leadership? And the way that I think about that question is, I think the world is very different than the world was when Jack Welch wrote his books on leadership, or when, and then you fill in the blank. And I don't think the world has changed. I think the world has actually shifted uh, in some very significant ways. And when you look at the events that have unfolded recently, unfolded over time as it relates to technology, as it relates to the emerging markets, as it relates to the shift from the west to the east in terms of economic power, these things cumulatively just lead you to, this is a different world. 
this is a different world than uh, what we'd like to do with our time first of all thank you for being here and for your interest in leadership we appreciate the privilege of spending a few minutes with you and sharing with you some of what we've learned and what uh, I'll do is just simply try to outline very broadly what we're going to try to accomplish we've done since the book was published lots of things from a media point of view lots of things on campuses and the questions that I seem to get quite consistently are Jim why did you go forward with this project why did you do it now and what did you learn and so what I'm going to do is just simply try to structure our discussion in a way that will answer those questions so first why the book second why now third what did we learn I'm going to turn it over to uh, one of your alums uh, and certainly someone that I'm very proud to identify myself as a co-author of this product with and then we'll talk a little bit about what we've done with respect to uh, using this at Deloitte a little bit about the Deloitte case study and then we will take your questions I'm also delighted that Steve Langton uh, has joined us who is the director of the Deloitte Center for Collective Leadership and is a very key part of what we're doing both in the marketplace broadly as well as what we're doing inside of Deloitte and so Steve thank you for making the journey here from from the UK and so let me uh, in the spirit of just trying to be quite brief to get to that what did we learn and to really be able to then say and how does that apply in the broad area of public policy I'm going to do this in somewhat staccato fashion uh, first of all why the book uh, I believe in leadership I've always believed in leadership I believe passionately about leadership and what I'm fond of saying is if you told me Jim as the CEO of Deloitte your challenge to take our performance to the next level and then if you said to me you only have one lever you can use to try to move Deloitte to the next level what I would do is choose the lever of leadership and so in that spirit of trying to then elevate the effectiveness of all of the Deloitte partners in terms of their ability to work as leaders I began the process of leadership events across the country in the US while I was the US CEO and then continued that uh, outside the US after I obtained the global seat and what we would do is come together as a group of partners and for 24 hours we would think nothing other than leadership and would really go on a journey of discovery related to leadership one of those sessions I was holding was in uh, Australia and Merritt happened to be in the room as we worked through this experience and after we'd finished he came up to me and he said Jim I'd like to continue this conversation on leadership and so Merritt and I went in a conference room and we went at it for about four additional hours after that initial 24 and what we discovered as we finished that is that we believe fundamentally the same things about leadership even though we've come at it from a very different points of view a different set of experiences and so Meridad put forward the suggestion that we ought to really launch a project to come at this notion of collective leadership and so I agreed to